England. The gift that keeps on giving. Every time there's a major tournament, England are always in the discussion as one of the favorites. Only to disappoint an entire nation in the end. The song The Three Lions has the famous saying, 30 years of hurt. That was in 1996 by the way. Today we go back and revisit one of those years of hurt. Euro 2016. After an abysmal performance in the 2014 World Cup, England decided to keep Roy Hodgson anyways. It seemed to have been the right move as England went on to be undefeated in their Euro 2016 qualification campaign, scoring 31 goals and conceding just three. Before the Euro 2016 draw, FA chairman Greg Dyke said England were going to win the title. England drew into Group B alongside Russia, Slovakia, and Wales. The English media seemed to have learned their lessons from 2010 and 2014 because they weren't being the annoying snobs they usually are. What probably contributed to this was the 2010 Easy newspaper printed by the sh** that aged worse than Steven Tyler. March 26th, 2016. Germany hosted England in a friendly. Both nations wanted to make a statement before the tournament, but in the end, it was England who came on top. They came back from 2-0 down to win through their flourishing town in the likes of 19-year-old Deli Alley and his natural linkage with 22-year-old Harry Kane. With a 3-2 win, it gave England hope as Euro 2016 was inching ever so closer. England entered Euro 2016 as the exciting young squad, as they were indeed the youngest squad to enter into the Tournament. Joe Hart was undoubtedly going to start as the England number one. Defenders included John Stones, Chris Smalling, Kyle Walker, and some other decent pieces to the back line. Roy Hodgson selected the likes of Deli Alley, Raheem Sterling, and Adam Lallana for the midfield, but he also selected Jack Wilshire who only played 141 minutes total that season. Mind you, this was after cutting players from the provisional squad. And of course, this was a given for the attack. Harry Kane and Jamie Vardy had phenomenal seasons in the 15-16 Premier League season. And of course, you couldn't have an England team without Wayne Rooney. There's actually this article I found about someone's reactions of each player selected by Roy Hodgson. My favorite part has to be when the blogger shows no bias whatsoever towards Raheem Sterling. England's refreshing young squad had two friendlies prior to Euro 2016. The friendly against Australia, they won 2-1 with 18-year-old Marcus Rashford being a threat for all 63 minutes he was on the pitch. Maybe he'll get some solid minutes in the tournament. The downside in the match against Australia was that the English defense was less than convincing, which is quite concerning when this is about a match against average as can be Australia. But then England beat Portugal 1-0 in a very dull match against a subpar Portuguese side at best. All that anticipated attacking threat was non-existent as England created very few chances. Some saw the friendlies as worrying and believed that Roy Hodgson's England didn't really have a distinct identity. He defended the performances saying this English side was not the finished article. Well, you better create the final article because the tournament is in a couple days, Roy. Wake up, babe. Copa 90 released a hype video for England. If you can bear to hear the truth Roy has spoken, Twist the fuck the is this shit? According to Odd Shark, England were fifth favorites to win the tournament. Goldman Sachs said they were fourth favorites. I've never seen any other example of an economist predicting tournaments, but if you want to know how reliable they are, there you go. For some football, a results and opinion based smartphone app asked more than 3,000 whose nations were taking part in the tournament who they thought would win Euro 2016. 80% of the survey said it wasn't England's year, but for all the pessimism in the air, there was still 45% from the nation that said England would reach the final. Listen, England fans, as much as I do not like your team, your media, or anything like that, I do have to admire your optimism. I don't know how you do it, I'm very envious of you, and hopefully one day I'll know the secrets to being this optimistic. Optimistic. England players had their say about how far they thought they were going to. Can go all the way? <laughs> That's pretty bold, Kyle. You too, John Stones? I can't really blame these guys, though. Say you're a footballer in their shoes playing for a nation like England, right? A reporter asks you the question, how far do you think your team will go? Well, you probably don't want to just say, eh, we might go round of 16 or quarterfinals, because uh, I, I feel like that might discourage the fans a bit. Surely, they could have been more vague and said, we like to think we'll go far. But as the English media are the most unbearable specimen on planet Earth next to Alexi Lalas. I do believe that LAFC would be able to sustain in an EPL campaign. <laughs> They probably were hounding the England players for a specific answer. England's first match was Russia. What the hell is happening outside? 
Huh. Going into the match, England had never won an opening match in European Championship history. The team looked incredibly strong right off the bat and kept the pressure on Russia's backline, suffocating them with drives constantly. England had nine shots in the first half, but could not find the net. Wayne Rooney as a midfielder throughout the match was exceptional. It may have been against the Russian side that allowed him way more time and space than most opposition, but Rooney took full advantage of it, creating multiple key chances for the English. He had 55 passes with an 86% success rate and 38 of those passes were in the opposition's half. Finally, in the 73rd minute, Eric Dyer scored off a direct free kick. It was a strike of beauty into the top corner. Soon after the goal, Roy Hodgson took off Rooney for Jack 141 minutes Wilshire. The intention was to retain possession which made really no sense because Rooney was already doing that. Eventually, England paid for Roy Hodgson's bottery and conceded a 91st minute goal when Russia's Vasil Berezutsky bagged a header into the net. After dominating practically the entire match, England did what they do best and found another way to f*** it up again. Although the win was thrown away, there were at least positives to look at, but there were some concerns as well. Raheem Sterling was not very inspiring, and Harry Kane didn't have a single touch of the ball in Russia's box. Kane was also taking corners for some reason. He took one fewer corner in that match alone than in 38 matches in the Premier League. But maybe Roy Hodgson saw something we didn't. The result was a tough pill to swallow, but then to make things worse, England fans were being ambushed by the Russian fans right after the match. With hooliganism dominating the headlines for quite some time, Finally, people were turning their heads to the England vs Wales matchup. A young, talented squad versus a group of quality players bonded by great amounts of team spirit. Oh, and Gareth Bale. Speaking of Bale, he was having some fun banter that slightly tilted Roy Hodgson, the English national team, and the media. He said Wales have more passion and pride, adding England big themselves up before they've done anything, so we're going to go there and we can beat them. Going into the match, the bickering seemed to work because after countless failed attempts from England, Gareth Bale just said f*** it, goal somewhere, and scored from 30 yards out a few minutes before halftime. As incredible as his goal was, Joe Hart definitely should have saved the shot. But this is Joe Hart we're talking about. Joe Hart, you mug! Right before the second half, Roy Hodgson, who previously had defended both Raheem Sterling and Harry Kane for their poor performances against Russia, decided it was time for a change. He subbed on both Jamie Vardy and Daniel Sturridge, and it paid off pretty quick with Jamie Vardy scoring off his third touch in the game. In general, England were a completely different team in the second. They were significantly more aggressive, constantly charging at Wales, just like the previous match opener versus Russia. The Welsh line stood still and suppressed England's antics as much as possible but the other substitute, Daniel Sturridge, would find the winner in the 91st minute. England finally earned their first win in the tournament and jumped to the top of Group B. Although the much better team against Wales, there were still concerns that needed to be addressed quickly. Joe Hart, for one, needed to stop being clumsy and error-prone. Then the bigger issue was who Hodgson was going to put his trust in at the attack. It should also be mentioned that Marcus Rashford came off the bench and made his debut as the youngest player to represent England in the tournament. He probably won't be much of a player though, let alone a figure for change in the next few years. England were pretty much confirmed for the next round, but the group was still up for grabs. After this successful turnaround by Sturridge and Vardy, Hodgson decided to start them in the Slovakia match. But that was two of six changes he made, including resting Wayne Rooney for Cripple Shear. Why did he do this? Simple. Typical English arrogance and underestimating the opponents. Sure, throughout the match England had the better chances, but I've said that three times and that doesn't mean much if you can't put the ball in the net. This shouldn't discredit Martin Skirtle's clinic and Slovakia's all-around strong defensive performance though. The match would end 0-0 and on the other side, Wales thrashed Russia 3-0. So they won the group and the squad and Bale got the last laugh in the end. Even though they had just finished second in their group, grabbing just one single win, England were still going on about how they were one of the best teams in the tournament. They had nothing to worry about, and they fancied themselves against anyone. The English media was being unbearable, as per usual. Oh, thank God we don't have to face Ronaldo. <laughs> it's little old Iceland. Quarterfinals, here we come. Hamir Halgrimsson, the head coach of Iceland and dentist too, said regarding the upcoming match, it's a dream come true. We will go into this game with full force to get a result. We believe in our ability. Then there was Icelandic player Elmar Bjarnason warning Roy Hodgson in England that underestimating them will be a mistake. There is still a dilemma that hadn't been figured out in the attack. Jamie Vardy and Daniel Sturridge made an impact against Wales, but couldn't produce much against Slovakia. Meanwhile, Harry Kane and Raheem Sterling were still in the debate for who is to start even though their performances were worse. And against an Icelandic defense difficult to break down, 
This is not something you want to hear from your camp. Roy Hodgson in the end decided to start Sterling and Kane while Sturridge replaced Adam Lallana on the right flank. It seemed to have paid off because England started well on the front foot with Sterling fighting some space in behind the Icelandic defense, winning a penalty after he was taken down by goalkeeper Hannes Haldorsson. Wayne Rooney converted the penalty soon after and England were ahead. Maybe this side is the real deal. No! By the 18th minute, Iceland was up one after scoring twice in a matter of 12 minutes. The Icelandic defense was amazing against the lifeless English attack, which could only resort to shots from outside the box that made you think England were kicking a Jabulani. Iceland's attack had significantly better shots on target, and also had about the same amount of chances as their opposition in the second half. This wasn't just England being completely inept, this was a hungry Icelandic squad that showed they were no fluke in the group stage. Hodgson made some substitutions, but one of them was Jack Wilshere, so you could already predict how that went. Marcus Rashford was introduced in the 85th minute, he completed more dribbles than any other England player throughout the entire match. And there it was, elimination at yet another major tournament. This moment being one of the darkest in recent time for England. Fans were furious as anger exploded towards the players who were trying to hide their faces in the grass. As England went home embarrassed, Roy Hodgson saved the FA some time and resigned from the head coach job. Iceland's head coach said this after the match, I was more relaxed than during the game against Austria. BBC Sport described the game as the worst humiliation since they were knocked out of the 1950 World Cup by the United States. Alan Shearer simply said, That was the worst performance I have ever seen from an England team. Ever. And shout out to the Icelandic commentator, because even five years later, he deserves some love. And so that was probably one of the many different videos I could probably make about England's failures. Jokes aside though, I hope you guys enjoyed this video, and also, thank you for 7,000 subscribers. Looking at the numbers still, I am in disbelief. I'll say it again because I feel like the video is still kind of lacking in views, but if you haven't watched it already, watch the Finland video. It's good. I promise you. If you want to get some video updates and just stupid tweets on your timeline, follow my Twitter. Also, follow my TikTok as I'm trying to get to 5,000 followers. Go ahead and follow my Instagram if you want, and if you want to follow the inactive Twitch that may or may not pop up with a stream once in a decade, go ahead and do that too. But anyways, until then, I'll see you guys.